Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you for this beautiful class, Father. Those people are on their way. Bring them here safely. strengthened by your word, comforted by your word. We want to enjoy you. Help us. Help us do that, Father. We need your help. We're doing this together with you. We're, we're sharing, sharing the burden with you. So, Father, we carry, you carry the weight. So, Father, meet us where we're at, Father, in this special place. Teach us. Meet us. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Uh, amen. 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 What a blessing. Amen. We're going to open up to Second uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5. I 
Let's start at 14. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constrains us. Let's look at what it means to constrain. Constrain. I think it's kind of like compel. Compel. That's right? Kind of Some translations say compel, right? Yeah. Let me see. Don't go anywhere. Okay, uh, verse 14. 1 Corinthians 5.14. Okay, watch this. 1 Corinthians 5.14. Okay, now I'm going to Bible Hub. Okay. And Bible Hub is great when you Google a verse. It comes up with, okay, it says, For the Christ of love compels us, one says. The Christ of love controls us. That's the New Living Translation, right? Oh, okay, that's good. The con controls us. Right? Um, the King James says the love of Christ constrains us. Right? Most say control. Oh, right? right. Most yeah, of them be. say control. Um, we are ruled by Christ's love for us. This one says the contemporary English version says we are ruled by Christ's love for us. That's beautiful. That's awesome. Right? Right. Um, another one says we are ruled by his love. Where I'm looking for the um, the amplified amplified here is the love of God controls us and compels us. It says both. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> controls and compels. So it's basically saying what I'm saying. What I'm picking up from all that is that it, it, it's saying that the love of Christ is what motivates us. Is the motivating agent in our life. It's the love of God. Most people would say in the old covenant would be the fear of God. Right. Oh yeah. You, he gives them all these commandments. He says you have to keep my commandments or you're under a curse. I don't know if that will motivate you. I don't know what will. It's like, dude, I don't want to be cursed, right? Mm -hmm. and, but he also promised blessings if you do keep them. Mm -hmm. So it was like, hey, it's a positive too because I could be blessed if I do them, but a curse if I don't. So that was a motivating agent, kind of a fear, a, a promise of blessings and a threat of a curse, okay? But in the New Covenant, it says that the love of Christ is the, compel the, love of Christ is the compelling agent, Right? Yeah. It says, because we judge thus that one died for all, then all died. Wow, that's weird. One died for all. Jesus, we understand he died for us all, right? Mm. He died for our sins. But it says, then all died. All right? Mm. And he died for all. Okay, now he's explaining right now. He says, verse 15, and he died for all. Now, what does that mean that he died for all? What, yeah. what does it mean that we died, but we still live? Well, because we we live through his resurrection it's not his, his death that saves us it's his resurrection and so uh, he died for the sins of the whole world and uh all are dead but through his resurrection we partake in new life that's how we've grown again absolutely yeah but what i like is how this explains what that new life looks like okay. what does that mean to us oh, okay. okay watch right. what it says okay. and he died for all that those who live right because we died we it says we all died mm -hmm. He says that those who live should live no longer for themselves. Okay, so he's giving you a picture of what that new life looks like. We're not living for ourselves now as a new covenant believer, dying with Christ and being risen to new life with him. I don't live for myself, right? But for him mm -hmm. who died for them and rose again. So he died for me. He rose from the dead. He went through all that suffering on my account. He did all that so that I can die with him and live not for myself, but mm -hmm. for him. Okay, that's good, right? That's, yeah. that's reasonable, yeah. right? Therefore, from now on, we know no one according to the flesh. Okay, so we don't see people in the flesh. E e even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no, no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay, so something happened. Oh, I could touch on that thing about no, one, no one after the flesh. If they ask us not to know, we know and know after the flesh. That's how God doesn't see us in the flesh. He sees us spirit to spirit. Wow, that's pretty good. He doesn't see us in, in our physical life. That's actions. good. He doesn't want us that's viewing good. people in the flesh. So God's going to be, he's going to do that good for us. That's pretty good. Because let's check, let's look at that for a second. 
Okay, so how do I not look at somebody in the flesh? I mean, you're acting out. You're acting a fool. You're criticizing me. You're judging me. You're being rude to me, disrespectful. How do I not look at him in the flesh? How, how, let's, what is a picture of that? Well, I just think, boy, this poor guy. I turn the other cheek, right? Jesus said, turn the other cheek, right? Love my enemies. He said, love your enemies. So how do I do that in a real, real you know, way? Well, I just think when you're acting that way, I just realize this guy, he, he, the Been devil's got his grips in him. This poor guy. You know, the devil, he doesn't know. And, I, and, and, some, and sometimes we've got to understand because he, he's, he is in the flesh, okay? Right. Right? He, he's, he's not in the spirit. If he's not a Christian, he's not saved, so he doesn't have the Holy Spirit in him. Right. right okay, right, so yeah. he is in the flesh, but he, I'm not to view you in the flesh. You view as the potential. Right. Who, who could be oh. Potential in Christ. I view your potential. I, I see good in you. you like look he said. Good, right? Whatever good is he in says, him, love those who hate you. Him. So to love you who hate me, I have to see some good in you. Right? right? Thank God for the good things. So, so I don't focus on your junk. And what Dylan is saying is that's how God views us. He's not viewing, if he wants me not to view you in the flesh, well, God's not viewing you in the flesh in any way, shape, especially since we're, we're Christians. Yeah, you love, he's you, not viewing you, you in the flesh. Him. He wants you saved. It's not his will that anyone perish. So that's he's not viewing you in the flesh. And he's not viewing me in the flesh because I have the Holy Spirit. I, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. So he's definitely not viewing me in the flesh. So he's telling me he doesn't want me to view people in the flesh. So he's not viewing us in the flesh. Yeah. Right? That's what the love chapter says. Love always sees your best, always hopes your best. Oh, that's good. It keeps no record of wrongs. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. You know, that's what God, that's, it says that's what love does, God, the, the love chapter. But the Bible says in First John, it says God is love. So that's him. He's not viewing you in the flesh. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That's pretty good. That's good. Yeah. I'm glad you expounded on that because I was going to gloss right over that. No, I'm glad you didn't. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's important because that's important because people are going to come against us. You know, people are going to say things. People are going to hate you. you no, know, even in this ministry, teaching Bible study, some people aren't going to like what they hear. You know, I'm just expressing myself. You know, sometimes I say things that, you know, I might kept you off guard. But I'm just trying to be real. I'm trying to be honest. You know, I expose my junk and I tell you, you know, my approach to it and things like that. And sometimes it might throw you off. You're like, so, wow, you know, that's kind of, you know, but I'm just being, I think it's more, uh, you can relate more if I come down, you know, Jesus, uh, Paul even said to a Jew, I become a Jew, to a Gentile, I become a Gentile. It, it's better if I can come to a level to where we can all relate. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't try and put myself out there like I'm Mr. Holy Joe, because I'm not, you know, in and of myself. You know, I thought Paul, James says we all stumble in many ways, so we all need, we better recognize that, that we all stumble in many ways. That means we're all in the same boat. So, and you use this shock approach for your th teaching. You you say something and then you support it with scripture, but it sounds shocking. Yeah, approach. that's a good point. It's, it's, it's called a shock approach that I learned from Andrew Womack. He's this minister, and, and he does a shock approach where he likes to back himself into a corner. He says something that's so shocking, so un like, what are you saying? He, he does that and it, only to, to, to back it up with scripture, to, to, to prove his point. Right. But it's like, it's, it's to get your attention, like shock approach. Yeah, it shocks you, it's like, gets your attention. Okay, now what you, you, how are you going to get yourself out of, out of, of this one? Yeah. You know, and then bam, he does. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so I, I kind of learned that, like Dylan says, I kind of use that sometimes. You know, I shock people with something I say, but then I support it with scripture. You know, and, that, and that's beautiful. That's yeah. good. It gets your attention. Yeah. Okay, but here it's saying that all things are new. So something happens through your faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in a Savior, seeing yourself dying with him and raised into new life with him to where I no longer live unto myself, but unto him. Okay, that's the new life. That's the new man. It's a new, it's talking about the spirit man because the flesh doesn't become new and the, our mind doesn't necessarily become new, but in our spirit, all things are become new. Old things have passed away. The old man, man is gone and the new man has come. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes on to say, verse 18, it says, and all things are of God. Okay, who has, past tense, reconciled us unto himself through Jesus Christ. To be reconciled means you were enemies, but now you're friends, mm. right? If I reconcile with you, we had some problem, some issue, and I come to you, I say, look, you know, forget it. You know, I, 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 just, can we, I, I just want to bury this thing. You know, I admit my, okay, I, I was wrong. What, whatever, whatever I do, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm just doing this to reconcile so we can continue to be friends, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, and that's what God did with, for us. Jesus dying on a cross, suffering in your place. He did that so that he can be reconciled to, to, to erase the problem. Okay, the blockage is sin. The, that's the blockage between you and God is that you sin. 
okay, and, and to remove that blockage so that we can be reconciled, God sent his son to die for your sins and suffer in your place so that you can be reconciled. That's how it happens. It's not through anything you do. It's through what God did. Now, now you do have a part in it. I'm going to show you in a minute where you do have a part in that, only in the sense you've got to want the reconciliation. I could want to be your friend. I could say, hey, look, I'm sorry. What you, you wrong. Let's say you did something wrong to me. You hurt my feelings, and it was messed up what you did. You talked about me behind my back. You said some rude things, whatever, okay? And I'm just like, I don't care. I, I like you more than that. You know, I, I value the relationship more than whatever you did. Okay, I want to keep the relationship going. Okay, so rather than dwell on that or leave, let that be a barrier, I'm just going to, hey, I'm sorry, it's my fault. I take responsibility, you know, just saying maybe, you know, whatever. I don't care. It, it doesn't matter. I just want the reconciliation. Well, that's what God did when he sent his son to die for your sins. He just wants the relationship going. He values the relationship more than whatever you've done. Right? That's what God did. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, and that's what he's saying. God has reconciled us unto himself. This is his doing. But like I say, if I say, hey, I want to be your friend, okay, I forget what you did. I don't, it doesn't matter if I, I take responsibility. That's what Jesus did. He took responsibility for our sin. Mm -hmm. So that's like me saying, you know what, it doesn't matter. I, I take responsibility. I did it. It's my fault. Mm -hmm. So let's reconcile. Now, if you still want to hold a grudge, if you still don't want to be my friend, you don't have to take my hand. So for this reconciliation, for any reconciliation to happen between friends, between God and man, whatever it takes, for it to happen, it takes two to reconcile, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you got to want the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. yep. you got to want to be God's friend. You know, people say, you know, uh, I've heard ministries go out to the street and they preach, they preach the gospel to people and they're saying, well, do you think you're a good person, this and that? And, and the people say, you know, they, they don't really want to accept Jesus. They're not big on the whole God thing and all this. But they, they say, when they talk about God, they say, well, God is, your, God is our friend, right? Yeah. You know, he is your friend. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, but they're not even believers, you know? But they're saying, well, God is our friend, right? I mean, he's, you know, right? And, yeah. and the question is, okay, but are you his friend? I mean, you're, he, he's your friend. God is your friend. He wants to be your friend. He reconciled you. But the question is, are you his friend? Do you want to be reconciled? You see what I mean? So it takes two to reconcile. You see, that, that, that's my point. Okay? And he says, um, he who had, verse 18, he has reconciled us unto himself through Jesus. That's how it happened. And has given us, the, and given us this ministry of reconciliation. And he says, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling himself I mean, recon, uh, reconciling, the, reconciling world. the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So, okay, so what that's saying is that's my ministry. Uh, that's what we should be ministering to people. That God was in Christ, not imputing your sins. Reconciling you into friend, making you friends. Okay, that's, what, that's the ministry. That's what our ministry is. He says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading by us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled unto God. Now, see, that right there tells you that there's a part you play in this. Where I'm imploring, he says that we are ambassadors imploring people, be reconciled unto God. He was in Christ reconciling you unto himself, wanting a relationship with you. He paid for your sins. He suffered in your place. Now you be reconciled unto God. Take his hand. Receive what he's offering. Receive a relationship. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. But this is heavy. Verse 21. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. To be sin for you. That we might become the rights of God in him. Now see, that's the key ingredient. It says that we might. That we might become the rights. It says that he became sin for you. That's a no-brainer. He did that. He became sin for the world. Right? right? He died for the, the Bible says that in 1 John. He says he died for, not only died for our sins, he died for the whole world. So he literally became sin for the world. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. But then it says that we might. There's a might there. Hey. 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 <laughs> Good to see you. Excuse, excuse, excuse. excuse. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I've got a feeling, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people might not have set their clocks ahead. Uh, because true. nobody's here today. So it's huh. not. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Amen. 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 That's all that. <laughs> We're looking to Second Corinthians chapter five. Okay. 
And we're at verse 21. It says, For he has made him, who's him? Jesus. That's right, it's capital. Who knew no sin. What does he mean he knew no sin? That he was sinless. He never sinned. He never sinned. Jesus could say, he said to the Pharisees, he says, which one of you can accuse me of sin? Mm -hmm. Huh? Right? Didn't he say that I came not to abolish law, I came to fulfill it? To fulfill the law, that means you'd have to go through your whole life with never sinning. Only way you could fulfill the law is to never sin. And he said, I came to do that. And he says, the devil has nothing in me. So, yeah. Yeah. So, right, the Satan, there's nothing he can accuse you of, right? Yeah, it would have to be. Yeah. For he has made him who knew no sin, he never sinned, to be sin for us. Okay, so he did that. That's something Jesus did. He became sin for the world, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But then it says that we might. Now, this is important because there's a might here on this end. There's no might in him becoming sin for you, but there's a might when it comes to becoming the righteousness of God in him. Mm. There's a might. So that means that, like he just said earlier, he said that he reconciled us unto himself. Now, it's our job to tell people God was in Christ, not imputing your sins, reconciled the world unto himself. Now, it's our job to tell people, be reconciled unto God. Receive the, the, re receive the friendship, mm. right? That's what he just said before this, yeah. right? Be reconciled unto God. <clears throat> and that's what he's saying, that we might become the rights of God in Christ because that only comes through you receiving it. That only comes through you wanting to be his friend. Like, right. It takes two to reconcile, right? If you wrong me, I want to be your friend. You, you know, and, and I just say, forget what you did. I'm, you know, forget it. I, I value our relationship more than whatever you did. Well, that's what God did in Christ. He valued our relationship with him more than whatever we do to him. Mm. And, and he sent Jesus to reconcile us. All right? But the question is, do I want to be reconciled? Do I want the relationship? Do I want the He wants to be my friend. Do I want to be his? You see what I mean? And that's why there's a might here, because it only comes through faith. We've got to respond to it. You have to respond to this. And how do we respond? How do I respond to this? Through faith. The Bible says, the just shall live by faith. We've got to believe this, that God wants to be my friend, and, and I want to be his. Mm -hmm. Right? And what did he say earlier? He said that, we lived, that he did this. We looked at 15, because verse 15, it says in the same chapter... Verse 15, it says, He died for us all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him. Mm. See? So this is not just, hey, okay, I believe, okay, and then just go live any old kind of way. He says that He did this so that we don't live unto ourselves, but un for Him. Mm. Oh, that's right? Good. Yeah. Good. Right, so this is not just, well, who I believe, and then just go live any old kind of way. This is a change, this is a new yeah. life. Yeah. Bible talks about new life. He says we're a new creature. He said that in verse 17. We're new creatures and everything's new. Yeah. And now we're not living unto ourselves. We live up for him. Yeah. So this is not some little deal. Okay? This is huge. But God moves in and he helps you with that. Mm -hmm. it's, you're not on Thank your Lord. own. Thank the Lord for that. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. So he's saying, take my yoke upon you, meaning that he's going to share the yoke. He's going to take the heavy weight of this burden. Mm -hmm. The burden of keeping all the laws... That's, that's the weight he's carrying. He right. fulfilled the law. The, keeping all these laws, 613 laws, you have to keep them under the law. He says, I'm going to carry that burden. I'm going to live a perfect life and never sin. I'm going to fulfill the law perfectly. I'm going to carry that burden. And now you're just sharing the yoke with me, and we're going to do this together. Yeah. It's like trying to, if those <laughs> are trying to count, uh, climb Mount Everest, yeah. Jesus skied down Mount Everest. He, he doesn't expect us to climb to the top. He skied down and gave us the gold medal put it around our neck and he said that I accomplished the climb. Isn't that Amen. Great? Amen. Uh, I mean, really, is your life with G the Lord in your life, are you really the same person you were five or ten years ago? That's good. Yeah. See, that's a good point. See, sometimes yeah. we focus on the things we're doing wrong and, and that's what the devil wants. He wants to blind us to how far we've come. We see our shortcomings. We see, like I shared last week, I, 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 I don't know if I explained it very well, but I was saying how I went into the jail and I did that ministry and all that, and then I got in my, you know, as soon as I come out of that ministry, and I just saw lives being saved, yeah. people receiving the Lord, and, and I come out and I get in my car and I didn't have that badge, and I noticed I didn't have my badge, and I got upset, really mad. I even uttered a cuss word. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but my point is, I never swear. That's not me. Yeah. 
So why do I act like I am? I asked Dylan, he's known me 15 never, years. Yeah, he's never, never heard never, me cuss. Never, about once. Okay, so I, I don't yeah. do that. That's not yeah. me. That's not, I just got yeah. upset and I, I was upset, you know. And, and look what I was upset about. I don't have my badge. I can't go into the jail without it. I can't minister. I can't, I lose the was, whole ministry without focus. the badge. I have to wait a couple of months before I can get another badge made. Right. Right. So it was huge to me and I got upset and it's like, I, I, I heard a cuss word. But my, my point in all that is, you would think, okay, what did you do? Did you confess? Did you, you know, right? You would, dude, the thing is, that's not me. That's not how I roll. I'm not going right, to act like right. it is. I just got upset. Yeah. That's all it was. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just a little yeah. temper tantrum. I, I, yeah, just a little temper tantrum. Yeah. I, didn't, I don't land on that. Because God want, the devil wants you to land, the devil wants you to land on that and miss the fact I just spent two hours ministering to yeah. these guys and I'm going to land on this one thing I did in a matter of seconds. Yeah. You know what I mean? You see what I mean? And that's what that might bring that up because we tend to forget all far we've come, how, how much I love the word, how much I'm serious about God. And, and we land on something wrong thing that we did. And the devil wants you to go there and think that's a big, the big, the big deal. Yeah. You know, it, 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 sin is horrible. It's bad enough for Jesus to go to the cross and die for us. But he did. You know, he did do that. So let's never forget that. That's why Paul says, I only preach Christ and him crucified. That's what Paul said. He, he only preached Christ crucified. You know, and that's something that people have to understand is Jesus wasn't preaching Christ crucified when he was walking on this earth. Right. He, did, he did talk to his disciples about he would go to the cross, he would die, and he would rise from the dead. He did talk about that. He did talk about being born again. He did talk about sending the Holy Spirit to mm. dwell in believers. He did talk about that kind of stuff. But he wasn't preaching him. He was, his main ministry wasn't preaching him crucified. A lot of his ministry was was law-based to condemn people mm -hmm. so that they see their need for a savior, yeah. okay? Because they're living under law, they, they seem to think that they were doing pretty good. Well, they weren't. So that's what I want you to see. That's what we're going to look at right now, okay? I want you to see some of the things that Jesus said because I could, I, okay, I just want to say, I, I, I could be accused of saying that Jesus' words don't matter. Okay, you know what I mean? People could say, right? right, right? right. You were in the class right. one time when one yeah, guy said that. He's, and yeah, said. but one, yeah. there was a guy in the class one time doesn't come anymore that he even said that. He said, so you're saying Jesus' words don't matter. I'm like, I'm not saying that. And I turned to the rest of the class. I said, am I saying that? You know, and, and nobody said, no, you're not saying that. You know, see, but, but, the, but that's the way people perceive this. Yeah. You know, that's how they think that I'm saying that. And just to show you, I'm not saying that. I'm going to show you what I am saying so that you understand the point that needs to be made so that when you read Jesus' words, you know who he's dealing with. Number one, you know when Jesus was talking, when he was walking on this earth and he was dealing with people, you know what? They were spiritually dead. The, these people did not have the new life that comes through Christ because that only come, that comes through the cross. The Bible says this comes through the blood, okay? The new covenant, he said, is, is through his blood. He said that when he shared the blood, like we do communion. When he, when he shared his blood with his, with his disciples, he said, this is the blood of my new covenant, which is for the forgiveness of sins. He's talking about the blood brings in the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. That's through the blood. He hadn't shed his blood yet when he was walking on this earth. He was dealing with people that were Adamic nature. They were spiritually dead. They did not have a new heart. They did not have the Holy Spirit abiding in them. They didn't have any of that. They thought they were pleasing So he God. couldn't talk to them like they were. Yeah. He couldn't talk to them like they were saved because they weren't. Even his own disciples, he couldn't talk to them as if they were saved. Yeah. You know, the, right? They were still unsaved. Yeah. They were, they, were the still, they were still ch dis children of disobedience. Yeah. That, to, to become a child of God only comes through receiving Jesus. And the disciples were the closest thing to that because they were hanging out with him. They left everything to be with him. Mm -hmm. So they were the closest thing to being saved, to being a Christian. Right. But they weren't saved yet. Wow. Yeah. That's, Jesus, that's why Jesus said, when I send the Holy Spirit, he will abide with you forever. Right. That's something that's coming. That's not here yet. That's so they were so confused. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's why he said, if you drink my body, eat, if you drink my blood, eat my... He said this one time, at the early, early on his ministry. This wasn't even at the Lord's Supper when he was talking about the communion, you know, it's supper. Early on his ministry, he said, you got to drink my blood, eat my body. And they were like, what? Yeah. This is a hard saying. Who could know it? And it even says, John 6, 6, 6. John 6, 66 says that many of his disciples left. Chapter now, 6, verse yeah. 6. Yeah. They left. They couldn't handle that. It was too heavy. So they didn't understand a lot of stuff Jesus was saying because he was pointing to a new covenant, which wasn't hit there yet. Right? 
And, and, and it says many of his disciples left. It's not talking about the 12. You got to understand there was a time when Jesus sent out the 70, another time when he sent out the 12. He had many disciples. It wasn't just the 12. The 12 was his inner circle. But when he says many of his disciples left, he's talking about the outer circle, yeah. you know? Right. And, and they, a lot of them would leave because yeah. they couldn't handle this stuff. Right? That's heavy, huh? <laughs> you know it wasn't the 12 because later after that, after he said many disciples left, he turned to the 12 and he said, do you want to go also? And, he, and Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Yeah, he said that right after John 6, 6, right 6. After, yeah, right after, right after they left. Yeah. He said, do you guys want to go too? <laughs> he says, no, who, where would we go? Yeah. You have the words of eternal life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So they were locked in. They were locking in for the most part. There was one out of the 12 that wasn't locking in. That was Judas. Right. right? But Jesus knew from the onset he was a devil. He knows who are his and who aren't. He knows who's serious about him and who isn't. Right, right. You know, so just get serious about the Lord, man. Yeah. That's all. And to be serious about the Lord means to just get to know Jesus and his love and his death and his forgiveness and his acceptance and everything that we get through him. And, and live from that. Right. Live from an accepted child of God. You know, you're already accepted in the beloved. It says that in Ephesians chapter 1. You're accepted in the beloved. Yeah. Right? That's your acceptance. It's not something I do. I don't earn it. The Bible says for those who work not. Right? Yeah. So I don't earn it. I don't, it's not something I do. It's something he did, and I receive it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So let's look at some things. Look at Matthew 15, 14. I want you to see. So these are some things Jesus said. This is heavy. This is going to be good. Okay, good. Okay? Let's see if I can get through a few of these. <laughs> Matthew what? Matthew, 15, Matthew 15, 14. I love teaching Bible study. <laughs> it shows. <laughs> I put this together this morning. I get these little ideas. I make notes, and then and then and then and then, and then Sunday morning, and then Sunday morning when I get up, I just add the scriptures that I need. I make notes, and then I go, and then Sunday morning I get up and I just add the scriptures to, to the notes that oh, I, I have. Isn't that Holy, great? The Holy Spirit gives you the, the text. The <laughs> yeah, scripture. to give me ideas to go with. Yeah. Like like this is what I got. This is what I put. He is a solution to. Solution to what? Well, blind, evil, lost unrighteous, dead. Now understand that's what Jesus was dealing with. He said, to the, he said of the blind, let's look, this is heavy. He said of the blind, he said, you're blind leading the blind. He told that to Pharisees, you're blind leading the blind, right? So if they're blind leading the blind, you know what he's saying? All they're, all blind. Blind. they're all blind. Yeah. They're all blind. They were all blind. I, yeah, we were all blind before the Lord. He, bring, I got scriptures to back up on where where he takes us in the New Testament with each one of these. Oh boy, these oh, are wow, good. Yeah. This is going to be good. And he says you're all evil. He said this. He said you though you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your ch your children. How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Another place he said, how much more will he give good gifts to those who ask? Mm. Right? Mm. But he said you though you're evil. He said you're all evil. And then he said, uh, as far as being lost, um, uh, well, let's, go to, let's, uh, let's go to that one. Where is that one? What is that one? Where do you say they were lost? Oh, yeah. Um, let's, go, Ma let's look at that one first. Matthew 15. Uh -huh. So I'm not sure where that one is. Let me see. Ma I wrote that down. Matthew 15, 24. Okay. Matthew 15, 24. Okay. You got it, Dylan? Yeah. You're there already? I'm there, yeah. How did you have the page already? Because you said Matthew 15, 14. So I was on the same page. Oh, 1524 is, but he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, see, the, all of Israel was lost. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. He says they're all lost. Oh. And if, if, if Israel was lost, then the Gentiles were definitely lost. Uh, yeah, you see that? Yeah, That's yeah, heavy. Yeah. Exactly. See, but this is what he's dealing with. People don't understand. People don't see this. That, that this is what he was dealing with. People that were blind, lost, evil, unrighteous, they were dead. They were spiritually dead. This is what Jesus was dealing with. This is why he had to wake them up mm. with, with some condemnation verse things to help you see, dude, you're not righteous. You're evil. You're lost. You're dead. Come on. Well, look at this. Okay, so uh, look at Matthew uh, 15, 14, same chapter. This is in the same chapter. He says, let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And the blind leads the blind. Both will fall into a ditch. So he's saying they're blind leading the blind. Mm. Well, who's the blind that they're leading? Well, they're, they're the leaders of Israel. They're, 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 the ones they're, that should know better. Yeah. They're the ones who should know better. They should be leading, you know, right? Yeah. Good shepherds. shepherds that are leading the sheep. Yeah. But apparently, he says you're blind leading the blind. 
So he's saying they're all blind. No, how do we come to... Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Okay, so the only way you're going to step out of blindness is to step into Christ. I have the scripture to support that. He says, we've been transferred from darkness into the kingdom of his son. Mm. Right? Isn't that good? That's yeah. heavy. Yeah. Okay, so you see they're blind. right here in one chapter, we see that they were blind and they were lost. Israel was all lost. Right? Okay? Mm -hmm. So, okay, stay with me. Matthew 7, 11. These are all in Matthew. That's pretty heavy because remember Matthew is a very, is like I like to, I believe in my heart that Matthew was the, the it's, 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 it's uh, I, I, is Matthew like the longest chapter of, of all the Gospels? Matthew's longest book you're saying? Yeah, the longest book. I think. It's the longest book. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's the long, it's the biggest book. It's written to the Jews, and if you notice, it's a lot. Most of the con, con, these you're going to notice that these condemning verses are mainly in Matthew. I mean, they're they're in the other Gospels, but in Matthew, it's saturated with with a ministry that that condemns, yeah. and it's coming out of Jesus' own mouth. Mm -hmm. He says they're blind, they're lost. We just saw that in one chapter. I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Okay, and you're blind leading the blind. So that's saying you're all blind. If you're blind leading the blind, guess what? They're all blind. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, exactly. He said that all Israel is lost. Uh, help me out. Okay, so Matthew 7, 11. Again, Matthew. You see that? Mm -hmm. He says, if you then being evil. Hmm, gee, who's he talking to? He's actually talking to his disciples, but everybody else is listening, right? Because Sermon on the Mount was where he sat down. He right, sat with his right. disciples. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. sat down with his disciples, and he's teaching them, but everybody else is listening. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the way it is, right, Dylan? Yeah, yeah, you're right there. So he's actually talking to his disciples, who are Jews. So they're lost. Mm -hmm. And, so the and they're, 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 they're sitting lost. under the, the, lead, the, the leadership of the Pharisees. So they're blind, because they're blind leading the blind. So they're blind. They're lost, too. And he's telling them, you, though you're evil... Right? He's talking to the Jews. Yeah, he's speaking to Jews, period. Yeah. A lot of people think that when he's talking to his disciples, he should be saying something different than he's saying to the Jews. Well, to some extent, yeah. But, you know, for the most part, they were Jews too. For the most part, they were living under the law too. They, they were not saved by grace. This they were not saved. They were not Christians. The, the Christians, were, they weren't even called Christians until Acts chapter 11. Long after Jesus rose from the dead, are they even called Christians? A lot of people think the Sermon on the Mount is written to Christians, but it, it, if we're not called evil, we're called children of God. I got those scriptures. That's what yeah. we're going to go to if I have time. I want to get into the scriptures. That yeah. I took each one of these, blind, evil, lost, unrighteous, and dead, and I take you to, I got the New, the New Testament scriptures that tell you a whole lot different. Right. We're not blind. We're not evil. We're saved believers, children of God, are not blind, evil, lost, unrighteous, and you're not dead. I have the scriptures. So this, this was for them. Oh, okay. Not That's heavy. Wow. Are you telling, see, you see what I mean? So to say that I'm saying what Jesus says doesn't matter is like, dude, come on, please. You know, I'm telling you, you need to take, con that, that's what I said. That's, the context is everything. You got to look at the context. Who is he talking to? Why is he saying it? What is the dispensation? He hadn't gone to the cross yet. He hadn't died for the sins of the world yet. Salvation through grace, it's, it's by grace, the, the grace, the, what the Bible says, we're saved by grace through faith, that wasn't available yet. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, that's heavy. Okay, so what did I say? Uh, verse, okay, so he said, you though evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? He said you're evil. A minute ago he said you're lost. Right? Mm -hmm. And he said you're blind. Watch this, Matthew 5.20. These are all in Matthew. For I say to you that unless your righteousness, your righteousness, right? What does the Bible say about your righteousness? Filthy rags. Filthy rags, I, right? Isn't that, an, I, I, let me see, uh, let's see, I have it here. Um, Isaiah, it, it, Isaiah 64, 6, 64, 6 says yeah. that your, our, our righteousness is filthy rags. Yeah. Okay, and Paul said in Romans chapter 3, he says, no one is righteous, no, not one. Right. So, so much for all righteousness earning a place in heaven if it's filthy rags, mm -hmm. if I'm not really righteous. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So what does he mean when he says your righteousness is... He's saying, I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. 
He's talking about your righteousness earning some. You know what that is? That's dead works. Dead works. It's dead works. Yeah. New covenant identifies that under the law, under under grace as dead works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Under grace, we identify that stuff as dead work, trying to be super righteous by your good deeds. It's called works of the law, deeds of the law, trying to establish your own righteousness, which he says in Romans chapter 10, we don't do that anymore. If you're still trying to establish your own righteousness, you're not submitting to the righteousness of God because Jesus ended the law for righteousness. When did that happen? When he went to the cross. It's a gift. It's okay. A gift. See, so what is he saying here? What does he mean by your righteousness? What would I be saying if I was telling you, you know what, your righteousness has to be better than, than pastors. Your righteousness has to be better than Billy Graham. Right. You know, what, what am I saying? What am I, what am I saying? What I'm saying is that, you know what, they're not righteous and neither are you. That's what I'm saying. That's the only way you can take that's it. That's what he's saying. The other way you take it is, is, is you better hit a lot of home runs, and that's ridiculous. Yeah, you know he's not telling him that. Yeah, he said, yeah. you better really pump up your righteousness, man. You really, you're, you, you know. Why tried. would he say that when he's bringing in a whole new program? <laughs> he's bringing in a whole new program where God is imputing his righteousness unto those who believe. Why would he be telling you to you pump it up? Yeah, you, you tie <laughs> the spices, you better tie everything. It's you're, crazy. <laughs> It's nuts. He's pointing you to himself as a solution. He's pointing out the problem. You're not righteous. And he's pointing to point you to the solution. That's what the Bible says. The law was a tutor to point you to Christ. He's tutoring you. He's teaching you that you need a savior. You're not righteous. That's what he's doing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's heavy, huh? And watch this one. Go to Matthew. And again, Matt, all of these are in Matthew. Mm. Okay? Wonder. Matthew 8, 22. Right, Dylan? And this heavy? Yeah, it's heavy, yeah. I never noticed that until just now. I'm looking at these. I'm like, wait a minute. All these are in Matthew. Yeah. 8, 22, right? Yep. Um, is that what I said? Yeah, that's right. Easy. <laughs> right. Okay, watch this. Okay, Jesus, I was, uh, um, uh, verse 19, it says, And a certain scribe came and said to him, this is a scribe, what did he say? You've got to be more righteous than them, right. Right? right? A scribe comes up and he says, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Okay, and Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And another of his disciples said to him, Lord, wait a minute, let me first go bury my father. Okay. And Jesus said to him, follow me, let the dead bury the dead. They're all dead. Yeah, right? Yeah, because of dead Why do you say let the dead bury the dead? It's like the blind leading the blind. Why would he say let the dead bury the dead? You know why? Because without Christ, they're all dead. Only way you're going to get life is through following him, coming to him. We get new life. Jesus said, you believe on me, you won't perish, you'll have eternal life. You get life through Jesus Christ. He said, if this guy wants to wait and not come right now, he said, I can't follow you right now. I got to go bury my dad, okay? He says, well, dude, let the dead bury the dead because the only way you're going to get life is through me. Because you're dead. So right there he's saying they're dead. We're all dead. What did we read? We're blind. We're evil. We're lost. You're nobody's righteous, right? Because he, there he said that you got to be more righteous than the Pharisees, right. right? To get into the kingdom. You know what he said to Nicodemus? He said only this to the Jews, the masses of Jews. Yeah. Nicodemus came for a private interview, and you know what he told him about getting into the kingdom? Anybody? Unless you're born again. You must be born yeah. again. Yeah. See, two different programs. Which is it? Do I got to be super righteous to get into the kingdom? Or do I just got to believe on Jesus Christ and receive new life through him? Right? Mm. And you'd be born again. I'm I'm just saying, Nicodemus was a teacher of the law, so he followed the law. So that's why Jesus said, it's not just the law. You've got to be born again. Yeah. 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 He's just taking you, he's trying to take you from the law into the new covenant of grace. Okay? But to do that, he he was limited on how well he could do that. Mm. Okay? Because he was still living under the law. Mm. Okay? Right. He cannot preach grace the way that Paul could after the cross. That's why Paul always includes the cross with his preaching. Right? Didn't Paul always include the cross? Yeah. All right? Because he said, I only preach Christ and him crucified. He always included the cross. 
Jesus, when he was walking on this earth, he hadn't gone to the cross yet. Mm. Now, now accuse me if I'm making, saying that Jesus' words don't matter. No, I'm just saying context. Yeah. Okay, you got to look at what he's doing. Why is he doing it? Why is he saying what he's saying? Who is he talking to? He's dealing with people under the law. Come on. And the people aren't taking this into consideration. They're just jumbling it all together. That's why we got so many people. That's why, that's why, that's why, um, what's his name? Um, uh, Eric Richardson, uh, Eric Richardson, um, Keith Richardson Richardson got up there and he did about, uh, did a sermon about four months back. And he said that, he he said that 80%, 80%, there was a Barna poll taken where they did a study and they tested like about a hundred different Christians. And and they said, they came up with the fact that 80% of Christians today are living under a law based, legalistic, Mm -hmm. performance based Christianity. And, and I, and that to make sure. it's easier to tell it, tell somebody as a pastor, do this, than here it is, you know, by grace, because people want to go. But, but, but what's the rule? What's the rule? And yeah. so that's yeah. why. there's no faith. Well, that's why a lot of pastors do that because they give you rules because it's easier to give rules than to say, well, follow Christ. You want to know something? Pray every day. Read your word. Those are the things to start with, and then find your way that way. Because once you've given your heart to Jesus ask for the Holy Spirit to lead you to the scripture. But it's harder for that as a pastor to do that. It's really, I know I've pastored enough and I've preached enough messages. It's harder to do that. So you have to go about different ways. And sometimes what happens is they end up preaching the law because of that. They end up preaching more. It's it's just if you mix, because Jesus said some things that are very condemning. And, 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 And people don't know how to take it apart and do it right. People say, off the bat, should you as a new covenant believer, Betsy, should you as a new covenant believer, should you be fearing hell? Fear what? Should you be fearing hell? Fearing hell, oh, yeah. Should you be fearing hell? Well, as a new believer? As a new covenant believer. As a new believer, not knowing. Born again, born again, child of God, Christian. I might. Right? Without doing, reading the I'm glad I'm asking this. This is good because a lot of people... First Jesus said, if you believe on him, you won't perish. Right. You have eternal life. Right. And, and he said in first John, and he said in first John, he said in first John chapter five, I could tell you, he said in first, he said in first John in chapter, chapter five of first John, he said, if you have a son, you have life. You're not dead. What he said, dead, bury the dead. He said, if you have a son, you have life. If you don't have a son, you don't have life. And I'm writing this so you can know you have eternal life. You should know. Therefore, you should not be fearing hell in any way, shape, or form. Okay? That, that's important. And, and when Jesus said that if you even call somebody a fool, you're in danger of hellfire, that is not for you. Okay? And people you're think that... The, <laughs> pe- <laughs> see, see, that's why people get mixed up. Because Jesus yeah. said some things that they think is for, for me today yeah. as a mm. new covenant believer. And, and it's not. Yeah, it says for you before you become. Because he said, he said, if you're even angry, you're in danger of judgment. But Jesus also said, if you believe on him, you'll never come under judgment. You've already passed from death into life, right? So if you already passed from death into life, have you? You believe on Jesus. You have the Son. You have life. But well, then you already passed. You're already in the door. He, he sealed you by the Holy Spirit until that day of redemption. You're locked in. So don't fear hell. Right. Mm-hmm. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. It says, we are not those who draw back into perdition, but right. those who believe under the saving of the soul. It says yeah. That in Hebrews. And let the word change you. We walk Peter. through that in First Peter. It says we have a, a reservation in hell. Let me show you. Let me confirm this for you. Let me confirm, the, let me confirm it. I'm going to confirm it with you right now with a singular verse, okay, with a few verses in First Peter. I want to help you. We need to look, look at First Peter. Chapter 1. No, wait. Second Peter. Easy. I want to help you guys. I'm glad I'm asking this. Sometimes I need to ask more questions in the class so I find out where people are at. Because I could be running my mouth, running my mouth, and it, it could be going over your head if I'm not really, if I don't take my time with it and see if you're really getting this. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. Second Peter. Second Peter. Now, this is common. For not only Peter, but but for um, for for Paul, mm. this term 
Grace and peace be with you. Grace and peace. We have peace with God because we've been justified by faith. The Bible says in, in Romans chapter 5, 1, mm -hmm. it says we have peace with God because we have been justified by faith. Yeah. We'll go there in a second. Remind me to go there. Because okay. I want you to see that you have peace with God. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you should be fearing hell. No. no. And it says we, we're accepted in the beloved. Should I be fearing hell? No, I'm accepted in Christ. Right? Mm -hmm. he, says you, though, he says we have peace with God because we've been justified by faith. That's why I have peace because I've been justified by faith. Your citizenship is in heaven. Oh, my God. You're seated in heavenly places. We looked places. at that a few weeks ago. This, your citizenship is in heaven. You're seated in heavenly places. That means you're, I'm already home. It even says that we're pilgrims passing through. Yeah. That this is not our home. Right. Okay, our home is in heaven. We're just passing through. This is just temporary, but that's eternal. That's and he true. says you have eternal life. But see, the problem is all people are looking for is a pat on the back and fire. See, here's the thing. That's a, that, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was reading that in this book. There's oh, this yeah. new book out. And, 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 that that yeah, he was, he was mentioning that. That people think, people think, this, this is the problem. People think that Christianity, this being saved, getting saved, is just forgiveness of sins and a ticket into heaven. Right. Okay? They don't understand that it's so much more than that. It's not just a ticket into heaven. That's, that's why people think that you're preaching. You're just preaching grace, <laughs> that grace stuff. That's, you know, you're, what's going to so. motivate us to live holy? You know, that's you're giving people a license to sin, right? right? Because, they don't, because that's all they think it is. They think that being saved is just a ticket into heaven. And, and, and as long as I keep all the rules, then I, I'm, I'm pretty good living in here now. Well, it's not just a ticket. In, it is a ticket into heaven. Yeah. And it is free, right? And, 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 it, 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 and it is um, forgiveness of sins. Right, right now, right? But, but God, is God giving you a new heart? It's God giving you his righteousness and the Holy Spirit moving in and living you, giving you new desires, a new want to. He works in you to will and to do what pleases him. That's there too. And people are missing this because they just land on this. They think that's all it is. Mm. Unless you understand, he's giving you new life, new heart, a new spirit, right? He says, I'm doing a new thing, right? Mm. Can you not perceive it? I'm doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? I'm giving you a new life. I'm giving you a new heart, a new spirit. You're a new creature. Okay, put off the old man and put on the new man. There is something new happening. He says, dude, that's heavy. Hmm. And that's what is in this book. This is a new book by Andrew Farley. It just came out. It's called The Grace Message. I, I really please good. get it. It's I really good. Really Andrew Farley, The Grace right. Message. I just, I just I bought this for Car. I just bought this for Carlos. I bought, I bought it on my Kindle. I got it on my phone. You can get it on Kindle and read it on your phone. But um, I, I just. It's I, really good. It's his, best it's his newest book. It's, it's, it's it really book. covers some ground in there. But but he's stuck on. He just grace, grace, grace. I mean, I, I got a, I got a, I, I, let me share this with you. Okay, this is pretty good. I have a friend out there, wow. and and I mentioned something about I, I mentioned so I know huh I got a friend shocking huh I have a friend out there. I sent him a, I sent him a page out of this book. Okay, and it talks about the love of God and that, that uh, um, we're going to treat people the way we perceive God loving us. And it was this, this page about, you know, so it's really important we understand how much God is forgiving us, loving us, mercy and grace poured out on us, his unconditional love for us. It's important for us to understand that so that we can treat people that way. Because I'm going to treat you the way I perceive God treating me. And I sent him that. And he said this, well, it's not all grace. He, he sent me that. It's not all grace. I said, I sent him this scripture. It says, if it is by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it is by works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. I sent him that. And he says, uh, he sent me something saying that grace is not free. It comes at a cost. You know. Um, but Jesus paid the cost. Yeah. And, and I said, it's free for us. Yeah. Yeah. I, said, I sent him this one. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, godly lives, right? So I say the grace teaches us to live right, okay? Yeah. Then, then he says, yes, grace is because of Christ, not because of us. Uh, I, I'm basically focusing on that first one. He says, not all grace. Okay, I want to deal with, what are you saying? What are you, what are you saying? So I sent him this. Watch this. This is good. Okay, um, you can't exhaust the grace of God. We should never be afraid of bragging on, grace, uh, on God's grace. Right. Right? To brag on his grace is to brag on God. Yeah. Okay? Our Father is amazing. His grace is amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I said, John Newton made a song about it. Amazing grace. I sing about it too. Mm. 
Amen. Isn't that good? <laughs> so sure, we should be bragging on God's grace. You're bragging on grace, you're bragging on Jesus. He's the one who brought it in. He's the one who, that's what grace is. Grace is a person. It, it, you can't talk too much about, you can't expound too much on grace. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. How, you know, he says his grace is sufficient for any weakness. Come on, dude, we should be bragging on grace. People want to limit grace. That's too much grace. All you talk about is grace. Dude, the Bible, that's all the Bible talks about in the New Covenant. That's all Paul brags about. He says, I only preach Christ and him crucified. That's grace. Yes. <laughs> yes. The problem is most Christians don't understand. They don't. Like I said, they think it's just a, they, a free ticket into heaven and sin's forgiven and that's it. But but then every time I sin, you know, you have to fix it. You have to keep the you got, you got to keep your record clean. But you don't understand the record stays clean because God gives you His Holy Spirit. God gives you a new heart, and you want to stay clean. It's not I have to or that I mess up when I do. It's I don't like it. I hate it. I don't want it. I'm a new. Gave that swear word at the jail. It's like. Yeah. So it's like, okay, now I'm living a new life. I don't swear anymore. Yeah, yeah well, you're right. Like, when I got upset, I got so angry. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to be real. I'm being honest with you. I think it helps you to understand, you know, that we all go there. We all might get so upset that we might. Because here, like I tell people, sometimes you see a movie and there's a swear word in there. It's hard to watch a movie these days without seeing swearing. Okay, so you, it, it, and at work, I, I work at a workplace and I have friends who, I have people, coworkers that swear there. I, I drive limousine and sometimes I have a whole group of, of 15 guests in a, in a, a drama van I got a bunch of businessmen but they're going out for the night and having drinks and they're having dinner and then they get in the back they're swearing and they're and sometimes I drive a stretch limousine I drive these people from prom night and they get they get in the back of my stretch they get in the back of my stretch limousine and they put on this music that's just foul and it's blaring me right in my ear these sw so if that garbage in eventually it might come out Yes, but right. that's not me. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. But that's not me. That's not how I roll. Like I said, Dylan can tell you, he's never heard me swear once in sure. 15 years. Sure. Right? Yeah. So that's not me, and I'm not going to act like it is. So when I got upset and I swear word came out, I just moved on. I just, yes. hey, yeah. I don't have to, oh, oh forgive me. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It ain't me. I don't roll like that. I know it. God knows it. And Dylan knows it. Why do I have to act like it's not true? That's all I'm saying, you know what I mean? I didn't want that to be taken the wrong way when I mentioned that because, like I said, I just did a ministry in the jail. I just preached a major teaching for two hours and the devil would have you land on this one little incident where I got a little few, less than a minute, I got upset and then I found, remember, I found the badge. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I keep it in my car. Mm. I, as soon as I got out of the jail, I don't know if you guys were here. Were you guys here when I shared that? No, she had last Yeah, week. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, because I just did a ministry, two hours of ministry, and I was just preaching to these guys, and they were receiving, and all this, and I come out, and I just, wow, I'm, you know, feeling good, you know, I just like, this is, you know, and I get in my car, and I realize I don't have my jail badge. I'm like, oh my god! They let them in, they let you in without yeah, it. Yeah, they let me in without it, because, because, they, know because so well. I, they know me so well, they don't even pay attention. I go in every week, so they didn't even pay attention. You know, you're supposed to, you can't, you're supposed to not go in there without your badge. Right, you're supposed to have it clipped on, you know. But I, I get, I get in my car and I go to leave, and I go to take it off to put it back where I normally put it. And I'm like, it's not here. I'm like, oh no, and I get all upset and frustrated because, oh no, I can't even do ministry without it. Ah, you know. And and, and all of a sudden, I, I check and it, oh, it's above my visor where I always put it. I, I didn't clip it on, right. and they didn't notice when I went in. That's all, no big deal, you know. So, but. I, but I got upset, even to the point of even saying a little cuss word. You know, I say a little cuss word. To me, it's, it's you know, I'm not going to make a big deal about it. You know, because, you're right? I got it. You said, holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> you just didn't say that. It's just, that's not my nature. I don't roll you like that. <laughs> and I know that. God knows that. Why am I, why do I, the Bible says he remembers your sins no more. Why do I got to make a big deal about it when he chooses? He says, I'll remember your sins no more. I'll be merciful to you in righteousness. I know how God's dealing with me. It's not like I got to make some, I got to keep, you know, short, uh, what do they call it? Short accounts. A short account with God. It's not like I got to work my way back in his good graces because I just fell out of grace. You fell from grace. No, the Bible says you fall from grace when you go under law. Yeah. You don't fall from grace when you sin. You yeah. fall into grace when you sin. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. You fall into grace when you sin. Whew. You fall out of grace when you go under law because you're, you're missing the whole grace message. The whole point of grace is you don't earn this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go under law, you do. 
explain to people why you do for Christ because you're not trying to earn it. This yoke is light. I didn't even get to go through any of these. You should, we're going to touch on Romans 5.1. Do you want to do Oh, that? yeah. Go, okay. Well, 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 no, wait a minute. We're going to go to 1 Peter. 2 Peter. Peter. We didn't go there. We never went there. Let me, let me go to these. 2 Peter. Thanks. And, and, and well, right? Yeah, Romans 5.1 about the peace Because I want to help you. Because I asked a few of you, and I asked about should you be fearing hell. Uh, yeah. I want you to be comfortable with where you stand with God. Okay? And, and remember, we, at this church, we, we teach eternal security. So if you if you if you're right with God, you stay right with God. He because he's imputing his rightness. See, that's what it means, righteousness. He's imputing his righteousness. He's giving you his rightness. So he makes you. We read last week. He creates you righteous and truly holy. So you're created. You're a new being. You're like Adam was created, perfect, right? Adam was created that way, but he fell when he sinned. The difference between us and Adam is we don't fall when we sin. We, can't, we don't throw it all away. He could because he didn't have Jesus dying for him. We do. Mm. Who? Easy, Henry. Don't hurt him. <laughs> what did I say, Peter? Second Peter. Second Peter and first Peter. Gosh, Second you guys, you guys are good. I can't find it. It's gone. First Peter's gone. It's after Hebrews. It's after, there it is. I got it. Okay, don't go ahead. Okay, here it goes. Okay. Second Peter. You ready? We've gone through this before, but I, I want to confirm with you what I'm talking about. What are, okay, listen, are you born again? Are you born again? The Jesus said that you receive that by faith, right? It's a gift. It's a gift. God gives it to you for your faith, right? He says, if you believe that he justifies the ungodly, he'll take your faith and give you righteousness. Right? He says, for those who work not. Those who work not, but believe that he justifies the ungodly, he'll take your faith and give you righteousness. So it's a faith righteousness. Right? So that's what makes you righteous. That gives you your right standing before God. Okay? That's what happens when you're born again. To be born again means you became a Christian. You're a believer. You're trusting in Jesus for your salvation. That's born again. Okay? And you've been born, right? And you've been, what it means by born again is you're actually born, a ch you are a child of wrath, but now you are born a child of God. That's what you're born into. We come into this world born in the flesh. When he means, we're, uh, we're, he says, that which is flesh is flesh, that was born of spirit is spirit. We're all born of the flesh. We we're all come into the world we're all, we're all born in dead, water, spiritually dead, and, and born of the flesh. Okay, but when you're born of the spirit, born again, what he's talking about, you are now born of the spirit, and that which is spirit is spirit, and that which is flesh is flesh. You, that's not you no more. Remember we saw in Romans chapter 8, he said, if you, if you, you are not of the flesh if the spirit of God dwell in you. And he says, if you have not the spirit of God, you're none of his. So you either got the spirit or you don't. Mm. Either you have the flesh or you're in the spirit. Right? right? So we are spirit beings now. And that's a beautiful thing. And God wants us to live from the spirit. That's what he means when he says, put on the new man, put off that old man. That ain't you no more. You're not the flesh. You're mm -hmm. the spirit. Mm -hmm. You're new man. You're new creature. We just read that. Mm -hmm. So he says, verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. As his divine power, his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness um, through the knowledge of him who has called us by virtue, virtue and glory. By which, by which, okay, by which, what does he mean by which? By that divine glory, giving us. By his divine glory, giving us, not selling us, right? Mm, that's good. By his divine glory, giving us these things by which we have been given. To us, exceedingly great preface promise. See, these are great promises. When he says, dude, I'm going to sanctify you, make you holy, I'm going to perfect you. Uh, that, that's what I love about this book. Uh, let me show you real quick. Watch this. I love what this, this guy, Andrew Farley, oh, wow. he, yeah. it's this guy, yeah. Andrew Farley, he rocks. But if you go to the back, this, just this alone is worth this book alone. Okay. Just, just these last pages. You see these last pages? These are all the scriptures in the Bible that talk about our, our, our security in Christ but look what he does. He takes them and he puts I, I, I. Oh, wow. He makes it from the first person. I, I. He takes I because it's saying oh, we, can, you, you we, you. But but it's it applies to Christians. Yeah. But what he does is he puts all in the first person. I, 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 oh, I, wow, I, that's I, powerful. I, I. Oh, it's powerful. I was it, I was I was with that in my hike and I was like, my gosh. 
Boy, do we have it good. You know, that, that alone, if you look at that, 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 that dude, you, that's what, how you got to read your Bible. When it's talking to Christians about what we have, you got to see that's me. That, uh, I, 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 I. You, have, you, you believe on Jesus, you won't perish, you'll have eternal life. Okay, I'm not going to perish, I have eternal life. Okay, you believe on him, you won't be condemned. Okay, huh, okay, I'm, I don't have to fear condemnation. Right? Right? Uh, personalization. Yeah, he says he will not bring in a charge against his elect. It's him who justified you. Oh, huh, I've been justified. I believe that he justifies the ungodly, so I don't have to fear any charges. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh, oh, well, you, there's no more, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Huh, you know what? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Period. Do you see how he take and put it in the first person? Mm. That's what he does for you. And it's pretty amazing. So watch this. Uh, verse 3. As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and God. Oh, yeah, I already read that. Verse 4. By which we have been given to us exceeding great precious promises, that by these, this is heavy, by these promises. What did I just show you? All these prom those promises. Those are all promises. promises yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. By those promises, you can stand on those, and he says, by these that you may be partakers of his divine nature. Mm -hmm. You're a partaker of God's divine nature. That's what it means. You're one with Christ in the spirit. That was it means you're a child of God, adopted into the family of God. You're a partaker of his divine nature, right? Having Second escaped Peter. the correction of the world through lust. Wait, is that the scripture that I want, Dylan? You want 1 Peter or 2 Peter? What, Maybe what, it's 1 Peter. What, what's the one you oh, want? Oh, that's what I want. I want a 1 Peter. I'm sorry. That's good too, though. You notice how he opens up 2 Peter. Watch this. Go back to 1 first, first Peter. 1 first Peter 4. 4. Okay. okay. Now, understand this is for... A, uh, you got to answer the question, am I born again? Okay, because Jesus said you're not going to get in the kingdom unless you're born again. So you got to decide, am I born again? Well, how do I know? You don't feel it. You know, it's not a physical birth. It's a spiritual birth. Right? He said you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. So we're born again of the spirit. It's a spiritual thing. You've got to trust it. They're just solid by faith. So we've got to take the faith and say, God wants me. He died for me. Mm -hmm. He counted me worthy. And people think, you know, I'm so unworthy, I'm so unworthy. But you know what? Je the Bible, Jesus, you know, you ever wonder about you're worthy, you're, if you're worthy or not? Find your worth in the cross. Jesus said you're worth dying for. There's your worthy. Wow. That's your worth. Mm -hmm. You're worth dying for. So don't stop this little, I'm so unworthy, I'm so unworthy. Dude, come on, the cross. Right. You're not unworthy. I made you worthy. You're not you want to see your value? Look at the cross and see how valuable you are. He saw you worth dying for. I paid my life for you. We weren't purchased with uh, gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. Yeah, purchase. Purchase, the Bible says. So, okay, look, I'm sorry, I, w I messed up going to chapter 2, but we, that was good too, right? It was good. Yeah. Okay, but chapter 1, for, for, this is Peter. He was a disciple who denied Jesus three times. Yeah. Come on. And he's talking about this is what we get as a believer. Okay, so look at chapter th verse 3, 1 Peter verse 3. Blessed be the God, our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, blessed be the, Lord, the God, our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. You know what mercy is? Withholding punishment. Mm. So God chose him, rather than punish you, he chose to adopt you. That's what oh, he's saying. Yeah, yeah. Rather than punish you, I'm going to adopt you and, and, and take this responsibility of transforming you. Isn't that good? Mm. His mercy, he, he, yeah. he adopted you. He, that's what it means to be born again. You're adopted in the family of God. You're now a child of God through adoption. Right? That's born again. Right? Has begotten us again. That's a born again experience to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus. It happened through the resurrection. So let's put our faith in the resurrection. Let's put our faith in Jesus died. He rose from the dead. I'm putting my faith in that. The Bible says if you believe he rose from the dead, you're, you're saved. Okay? So that's what he's talking about. Through the resurrection. Right? To an inheritance. Are you ready? To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled. It doesn't fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you. Dude, sound like I should be fearing hell? I don't know about you. I got a reservation. Right. He told his disciples, I go to prepare. There's many mansions in my father's house. I go to prepare a place for you. And he says, if it weren't true, I wouldn't tell you. So this, you got to say, see this and say, hey, if it weren't true, you wouldn't be telling me. You got a reservation in heaven. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, now watch because, watch. See, go to Romans 5.1. 
We'll close it with this. I had so many good ones to go with. Those blind, evil, lust. I had good ones to go to, but, you know, we're limited. What can I say? But I just had to go where the Holy Spirit leads. Right? Right. Okay, so you stop fearing hell. Okay? Hell is not an option for a believer. That's the whole point of being saved. That's what you're saved from. Yep. Right. And not only saved from hell and forgiven of every sin and cleansed of all unrighteousness, but he is imputing his righteousness, imputing his Holy Spirit, giving you new life, and you're a new creature, and now you are secure in that place because of what he's giving you, what he's, what he's putting in you. It's called eternal security. Here at this church, we believe in eternal security. Some churches don't, but we do. Okay, and that means you're secure in hell. He says, he, he says his gifts and his callings are irrevocable. Right? Right. Irrevocable gift. He's given you the Holy... Once he gives you the Holy Spirit, he says that gift is irrevocable. Right, Dylan? Right. Yeah. He says that, yeah. Romans 5.1 5, <coughs> Therefore, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says no one will be justified by the law. Okay? So let's forget the law right now and let's see what justifies us. <coughs> well, how are we justified? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Put your faith in your justification. In Romans 4, he says, he, if we back up to chapter 4, it says, um, chapter 5, it says, but to him, uh, ch ch I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 5. You want to see where you're justified? This is where justification comes from. Mm. Okay? And it's not for anything you do. But to him who does not work. Okay? So that right there tells you it's not for anything you do. Right? Chapter 4, verse 4. Verse, four verse, <coughs> chapter 4, verse 5. Same book. Romans. But to him who does not work. That means it's not anything you do. But you just believe on him who justifies your little ungodly self. Your faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, so that's, that's faith justification. That's where you get justified by faith, right? Faith right. And when you jump to 5.1, it tells you what that looks like. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh my gosh. Mm. Do you see that? So let me ask you again. Should we be fair in hell as a new covenant believer? No. Not even a little bit. Right? Mm -hmm. Go to go to First John five. If this isn't lock it in, I don't know what will. Okay. You know what? There's a scripture that says, "We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony." Have you ever heard that? That's in Revelations. Revelation. You overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Okay? Watch this. Verse 11. 5.11. 5, 5.11. 11. 1 John. 1 John 5.11. Because, okay, what's the testimony? Oh, wow. He said, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Here's the testimony. Okay? And this is the testimony. That God has, past tense, given us Gift. Eternal life. Gift. Given. Huh? Given is a gift. Yeah. And this life is in his... There's our testimony. We over, This is how we overcome. You want to be an overcomer? Dude, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Here's my testimony. That God has given us eternal life. This life is in the Son. He who has the Son has life. What do he say? You won't perish, but have eternal mm -hmm. life. So mm -hmm. you don't perish. Right? He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know, not hope, not question, not doubt. You can know you have eternal life. Oh, buddy! He says the same thing in the Gospel of John 3, the last verse of chapter 3. He says that he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who believes not the Son still wrath see, of God. Yeah, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides. True. Him. See, that's where the wrath of God is for the unbeliever. That, that, where do we, if yeah. we want to look at that one real quick, we can. Well, what was that? John three. It's just John three thirty six. John three thirty six. Look at that one. So you know who has to fear hell. Who should fear hell? These are good scriptures. I'm glad we're going here. 
I want us to understand our security in Christ and live from that so that we can enjoy life. Hey, Jesus said, I came to give you life that it might be more abundant. Right? So we can enjoy... You're never going to really... You're never really going to enjoy life unless you're really enjoying God. Okay? Because that's the thing. Jesus said, he says... Uh, uh, this is, he said, this is eternal life, that you know the one true God and the one who he sent. That's eternal life, is knowing God, enjoying God. So you're never going to really know life, you're never going to enjoy life unless you're really enjoying God. So let's put that first. Mm. Okay, he says, delight in the Lord and he will give you the desire. He'll give you new desires, he'll give you the right desires, you just delight in the Lord. He says, delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you right desires. I'll give you the desires of your heart. I'll give Most people think that means, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Right? Right? And I saw that when I was in jail. I saw, when I was in jail, I saw that verse. And I was like, woo, I just delight myself in the Lord, start enjoying God, reading the Bible, you know, say, you know, then, then he'll give me the, my desires. Woo, -hoo. you know, anything I want. You know, but that's my will. That's not his will. Right. I was thinking selfish, not selfless. Mm -hmm. I, was, I wasn't thinking of putting him first. I'm thinking about Henry. Well, gee, he'll give me the desires of my heart. Woo! -hoo. No, with the way you got, the way I read that scripture now, that I've grown and matured, I know that he comes first. Now I say, he delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. He will give you right desires. Then he can give you the desires of your heart because you're putting him first. So you see that? See, so if you read that from a selfish perspective, you can think, woo, he's going to give me the desires of my heart. Well, first he's got to give you right desires. Then he can give you the desires of your heart. So he gives you the right desires. Yeah. Isn't that great? So let's look at this. Verse 36, John chapter 3, 36. This is it. So you stop fearing hell. He who believe would 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 you consider hell being the wrath of God? It's punishment. It's torment, right? Where the worm never dies, where there's gnashing of teeth, right? And it say that gnashing of teeth, the worm never dies, agony, thirst, right? That's what the Bible talks about. Hell. It's not pretty, right? And it's eternal. Eternal fire, it says. Eternal fire. And the Bible even says that that was prepared for the devil and his demons. It wouldn't, hell wouldn't even prepare for us. God wasn't looking forward to you sitting in hell. It said devil and his angels. Yeah, it says he's praying. He yeah. That's demons. When he was, separating, when he was oh. separating the sheep from the goats, he says, you go ahead. You go, the, the goats, he said, you go ahead and you go to the to eternal fire that was prepared for the devil and his demons. It was prepared for that. It wasn't even prepared for it. wouldn't mean for us. But who are the goats? Unbelievers, people who reject Jesus, who want to do it their own way. That's the goats. And yeah, go ahead. You want to go to hell? Go. You know, right? That are, that are so what? Verse 36. He who believes in the Son has, has eternal life. Present there it is. Tense. Everlasting life. Huh? Present tense. Yeah. Present tense. You have it. It's yours. Enjoy it. You know? And he who does not believe on the Son will not see life. Isn't that kind of like what he said, what you said, what he said in First John? Mm -hmm. He said, you have the Son, you have life. You don't have the Son, you don't have life. Right? He said, he who does not believe on the Son does not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. That's the, those, that's the one who should fear hell. That, we shouldn't. He said, that's not that wrath of God. It's not for you. It's not for you. Woo, amen, huh? Amen. I had some good scriptures to go with that blind. I had so many scriptures to go with evil. Maybe I'll, I'll see if I get around to that, see what happens sometime in the future. But I, I'm telling you, you can get this this book, The Grace Message by Andrew Farley. Okay, it rocks. It's, it just is, like I said, those last few pages. Whew, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. Do, does it ever sound like I'm saying, does it ever, do you guys ever get that impression that I'm saying that what Jesus said doesn't matter? I mean, you could... Uh, they, they might, if you, if you hadn't said, expounded on the fact that, you know, there was pre-cross and post-cross. Yeah. And who he's talking to. You know what I mean? They hadn't di differentiated that. Yeah. And most people don't. Yeah. And because it's such a hard pill to swallow, some people reject it. Right. 
you know, they think they, they'd rather just think that I'm just taking Jesus' words. And here's the, here's the thing: I, I believe Jesus meant everything he said, yeah. uh, everything he said. But you got to look at the context: who he's speaking to, why is he saying it? He meant everything he said when he said that. He said uh, uh, he said if you, your right arm causes you to sin, you know, uh, cut it off. You know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And and then he said this: he said, for it is better for you to go to. Uh, into life. To heaven maimed yeah. than to go to hell with your whole body. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So he meant that. That's he meant it. It is better for you to go to heaven maimed than to go to hell with your whole body. Right. He meant it. He wasn't exaggerating. He he meant what he said. Right. You know? So and when he talks about hell, you know, if you call somebody fool you endanger your hellfire, he meant it. Under law. For those living under the law. Those who say it's hyperbole. Yeah. Those who but, say but, he didn't but, mean it. But we're those, not under law. We're yeah. under grace. Huh? Yeah. Those who say he doesn't mean it. It was hyperbole or not taking the word. Yeah. Jesus. A lot of people say he was exaggerating. They're That's the ones. Taking, that are, the they're, the one, they're the ones we're that are taking, taking his words words lightly. They're the ones that say, oh, he's just exaggerating. Yeah. He didn't yeah, they mean that. They're the ones that are not taking his words seriously. The problem was he was saying it to the people that were in that context. They were under the law. And that's what he was taking to them. The law of understanding. So that. If they understood it, they would move from the law to grace. And to do that, they would accept Jesus Christ, just like he told Nicodemus, you must be yeah. born again. It's not, I didn't, he didn't preach in all this other stuff. No, he realized, you're, you're, okay, you're one of the teachers, you're, you're trying to be good and a good teacher. So it's not about what you're teaching. You must be born again. He just, he just went past all that stuff on the Sermon on the Mount to him because Nicodemus was, you know, he was trying to live his life under the law. And so he said, it's not about the law. you got to be born again. Well, that, like that one guy came to Jesus. He said, what, he, he said what, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you, you know the law. How, how, how he you, says, how, why do you call me good? Yeah, yeah. yeah he says. Uh, why do you call me good? Because if you're calling me, he's basically saying, if you're calling me good, you're calling me God. Because you're all evil. It's, that's what, he says, why? And then he says, and there's only one good. There's none good. And then you're saying, then he said, what does the law say? You know, you know see, you're getting me mixed up. There's two, no, there two, there two, two different incidents. There are two different incidents. What he said was, he said, well, you know the law, uh, well, he says, uh, you know the commandments. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a different one. Okay. There was two different incidents. I was thinking of the other one. Okay. He says, well, uh, you know the commandments. Don't lie, don't steal, don't do any of these things. Jesus gave him the law. Mm -hmm. And the guy says, well, I've done all these since my birth. And which, he's, which is a lie. Hold on, hold on. commandments he broke, right? Hold on. Which is a lie. But Jesus didn't go there. He just told him, okay, well then, uh, if you really want to be perfect, okay, if you want to be perfect, well then go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. Well, so what Jesus was basically saying to that man, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't saying go sell everything. He was telling him that it doesn't matter what you do, you still have to follow me. The, uh, the only way you're going to be saved is through me. Okay, so it's basically saying, okay, so you think you're keeping the commandments, dude. You're not even past the first one. The first commandment says, have no other gods before me. And I'm going to show you that God, you're not putting God first. Mm -hmm. go, go give all your money away. Mm -hmm. Your money's your God. Mm -hmm. God isn't. Wow. You know, so he just showed, he just revealed him who his God really was. Mm -hmm. Right? And you're not even past the first commandment, friend. Right. So it doesn't matter what you do. Because the guy asked, what must I do to gain eternal life? So yeah. he told him, you've got to keep all the laws. That's what you've got to do if you want to earn it. You know? And he says, oh, I'm doing that. I got it. Solid. He's like, go whack. And Jesus really? said, Jesus also, you know? <laughs> Jesus also said, your money's your God. Yeah. Yeah. He says, what must we but do? But it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. You're still going to have to come follow me. Period. He, he, he didn't leave that. He didn't just tell him, go sell everything and give it to the poor. Yeah. He said, you're still going to have to come follow me. Because that's the bottom line. And his disciples said, well, what? Can I ask a question? Uh, do you have to be a theologian to talk about the word of God to people? I'm not. He's not. I've never been to seminary school. I was ex-convict. I'm a drug addict, ex-drug addict. I had this guy keep trying to shut me down, telling me, oh, well, do you have, are you a theologian? Do you have a degree? No, and I'm ridiculous. Trying to tell him my words weren't valuable or that what I was saying wasn't valuable. Well, that just goes, that says more about him than it does about you. You know, and why would he, 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 he bring that to point so he could keep doing what he was doing? Is that what he's I, I think, I think sometimes when people don't realize that they're being narcissistic, it's really that they just, there's some kind of insecurity. They, was he they have to, be, to put you down in order to lift so. themselves was, up, and, yeah. it's, 
And if they've done it for so me. many years, no, it's subconscious. Was he, was he telling me to be Christian? Yeah, he said he went to seminary school for many years, but then decided to uh, decided to have a wife. Well, a situation like that, you well, said... Well, if that's the 